Good afternoon, Ireland, and good morning, the US. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this Credence Showcase event. Credence is a research project that was undertaken by three centres, one in Ireland, the Marai Centre, one in, the, in Northern Ireland, the Queen's University, Belfast, and one in the US, the, the Freedom Centre. And what we're going to show you today is some of the research that we've carried out, but we'll also hear some feedback on that research from members of our industry advisory committee. And that's in session one. And in session two, then, we'll have some reflections from others on the impact and outcomes uh, of this research. We, we do encourage you to provide us with some questions uh, during the course of the, uh, the, the session today. And if you please use the Q&A function within Zoom, uh, and we'll have a, a discussion uh, at the end of the presentations, uh, focusing on uh, trying to answer some of these questions. Um, I, I want to thank the funders for this research, without which it wouldn't have been able to happen. That's Science Foundation Ireland, the National Science Foundation, and the Department for the Economy in Northern Ireland. I, I think this event is very timely, in particular given the recent increase in ambition in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and in the US on CO2 emissions, carbon dioxide reductions. Um, it's been a great honour to work on this project. Uh, it's um, been very successful, as, as I'm sure you'll agree, as you hear from the uh, presenters, the respondents, and also the, some of the reflections in session two. So to kick things off, before we start the presentations, we, we've shown a short video uh, about Credence that we made um, a year or two ago, and we've updated now that to include some of the outputs and outcomes. So I'll um, pass on now to, to show that video and then I'll introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Now a new climate bill, which mirrors what the UK did in their legislation, but is, I think, setting probably one of the most ambitious targets. We want half our decades, half our emissions in this next decade. I don't think that's done before, done before but I think Ireland will come out a lot stronger as we head to net zero. To do it, I'm taking research now from the University College Cork Mara Institute. They looked at how we get to net zero. They estimate, well, we'll start by, in this decade, electricity, 7 to 80 percent renewable at the end of this decade, net zero, no fossil fuels by the by, uh, middle of the next decade. So that gives you a snapshot of what you're going to see now in, in a bit more detail. And we're ready to kick off with the, the first presentation, uh, which will be delivered by Professor Joe DeCarlis, who, who leads from the Freedom Center. And he's going to talk about how can we improve our understanding of electrification and decentralization across the US, Ireland, and Northern Ireland, uh, drawing on the, uh, the research findings from the Credence Project. 
Over to you, Joe. All right, thanks very much, Brian. Let me share my screen here. Okay, can everybody, can you see that, Brian? Yep, perfect. Okay, great. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Joe DeCarlos. I'm a professor at uh, NC State University. And in this presentation, I really just wanna give a broad overview of our, our Credence project. I wanna talk a little bit about the original motivation, a little bit about the project team, our objectives, and then, and then just highlight some of the key insights and outcomes from, from this work. So this project really began back in 2015. We conducted a workshop in Dublin where we invited energy experts across the three jurisdictions. And one of the things we did was we envisioned the ideal grid of the futures. And uh, we all came to general agreement that, you know, the ideal grid of the future is, is going to be decarbonized and, it's, and that distributed renewables are going to play a key role in that. So then we moved from that vision to figure out, okay, well, how do we realize that, that future vision of this ideal grid? And we realized that there were two trends that were occurring. One was towards increasing electrification. So if you think about all of the end use demands in our homes and, and commercial buildings, there's this increasing trend towards meeting those demands with electricity. And then second was decentralization, where we're moving from large centralized power plants to more uh, distributed uh, renewables as, as well as storage. Um, and in, in addition to these, these broad trends, we identified two major enablers that cut across these trends. One is telecommunications. We need a method of secure communication among all of these distributed assets in this, in this future grid. And socioeconomics, we need to understand uh, uh, public preferences and um, consumer behavior around many of these technologies in order to uh, determine how the system will be will be developed. Uh, that led us to formulate three goals for the project. Uh, one was to develop communication standards that can be uh, integrated into the devices across the system. The second was to assess the impact of the trends towards electrification and decentralization with modeling tools. And, and you notice in the diagram there that uh, modeling and analytics is central to all of this to understand how this all comes together into the in, in the future. And then third, to understand the socioeconomic phenomena that can affect these trends towards electrification and decentralization. We split the project into uh, four different work packages. So the first work package was really focused on developing and demonstrating a method of secure communication. Work package two was focused on decentralization. What are the impacts of various levels of decentralization? And then how does that compare with a more uh, conventional uh, centralized power system? Work package three was focused on the role of electrification. So we ran uh, energy system models that cover the whole energy system and looked to see to what degree we end up with electrification of, of end use demands. And then finally, work package four was focused on uh, consumer behavior and, and public uh, preferences towards different energy infrastructure and how that might affect uh, this tr these trends towards electrification and decentralization in the, in the future. This was our uh, project team. So uh, as Brian mentioned, we have Queen's University Belfast representing Northern Ireland, we have the Marais Center in Ireland, and we have the Freedom Center in, in the United States. We also had a host of uh, PhD students and researchers that were uh, funded on this, on this Credence project, and they're uh, shown in the, in the bottom row here. In terms of our expertise, so at Queen's University Belfast, they have the Energy, Power, and Intelligent Control, or EPIC, uh, research cluster, which is focused on integrating distributed sources of energy into, into power networks. They also focus on system control and the design of intelligent networks. Uh, Marai in Ireland has expertise in energy technologies, including marine energy, uh, climate, and they also have the capability to do whole energy systems modeling of Ireland. Um, and these centers have been really critical in, in helping Ireland as it moves towards increasing shares of renewables. In fact, Ireland has the highest share of variable renewable energy uh, for a synchronously isolated system. So they're meeting 40% of their uh, electricity demand on, on average with renewables and 70% during peak renewable periods. 
In the United States, we have the Freedom Center. Freedom stands for Future Renewable Electric Energy Delivery and Management Center. Uh, and it's focused on the design and management of distributed energy resources, in including high-powered semiconductor components like solid-state transformers that can, that can basically deal with either AC or DC electricity. Uh, the diagram here shows a, a solid-state transformer that's integrated into a distribution network. And the real vision of the Freedom Center is to create an internet for energy where you can have plug and play uh, distributed renewable sources storage on the distribution network. And um, the Freedom Center also has the capability to do whole energy systems modeling of the, of the United States to complement the, the expertise at Mirai and, and Ireland. Okay, now I just want to step through a few uh, research highlights just to, again, highlight some of the work that's that's been conducted as, as part of this project. So this particular paper was led by a PhD student at uh, University of College Cork, uh, Laura Mehegan, and it was really focused on um, understanding the role that distributed generation can play in future electricity systems. Part of the paper focused on conceptualizing kind of the ideal tool to understand what role distributed generation could could play in future uh, energy systems. And we think about it as kind of this, this layered approach. So you need really detailed network analyses and stability assessments of the relevant power system. So this is, you know, highly technical work over, you know, looking at dynamics over a few seconds. You expand and we need to, all, one layer out, we need to be thinking about, okay, well, how do these devices get deployed over time? So we need to be able to perform capacity expansion modeling. You go one layer beyond that, and we need to consider markets uh, and, and human uh, behavior and, and how that will affect the deployment of distributed generation. And then finally, in orange, the outermost layer is considering the whole energy system and what feedbacks the whole energy system provide to the electric sector and uh, to the deployment of distributed energy. And I think this nicely illustrates the challenge and complexity of, of trying to capture all of the relevant dynamics. And the Credence project as a whole has really helped to shed some light on, on the required modeling approaches here. A second research highlight, this was a, an event that took place at the 2017 uh, International Energy Workshop that was held in, in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, there was a side event uh, that was sponsored by the International Renewable Energy Agency, or ARENA, and it was focused on um, basically is high variable renewable energy like wind and solar, is it, is it going to be cheap and easy? And the panel focused on addressing three key questions. One is, you know, what are the important characteristics of variable renewable energy um, that we need to consider in long-term uh, energy modeling? Uh, what are the best practices associated with modeling variable renewable energy in these models? And then what are the gaps? What are things that we need to work on as modelers in order to um, do, do a better job looking at renewables integration? We had a number of experts uh, serving on the panel. They're, they're listed here. And this was really an excellent opportunity to do broader outreach and engage with the community around topics that are central to our, to our Credence project. Uh, research highlight three, uh, this is a, a paper that looked at deploying 100% renewables in Ireland to basically meet all end use demands, not just uh, electricity, but all energy needs. Uh, this is actually the first paper to assess the feasibility of 100% renewable energy system in Ireland. Uh, the work included a broad range of scenarios to try and address uh, different uh, technical and economic feasibilities. So one example is, is turning on and off biomass imports into Ireland to see what effect that has on, on cost and uh, emissions and uh, technology deployment. Uh, the paper also looks at, you know, what are the effects of pursuing uh, carbon reductions with policy versus uh, focusing on the, de the deployment of renewables. Once it was published, it was actually selected as an editor's choice uh, paper. And so I think that just speaks again to the, the relevance and the, the importance of, of the work. The final research highlight uh, focuses on public acceptance of, of renewables. This is work that was con conducted um, at Mirai. And it had this work had two key components to it. The first one was survey work. So they actually conducted uh, surveys of Irish households to assess their uh, 
their acceptance of different pieces of, of energy infrastructure. So for example, onshore, um, onshore wind, overhead transmission lines, solar uh, storage, and then those survey preferences were then taken and then encoded into an energy system model. The energy modeling focused on consumer preferences towards uh, wind and, and transmission. And uh, it was encoded into several different scenarios. So for example, you see a scenario here with full acceptance versus low acceptance. I'm not gonna go into the specific results, but the idea here is that we were, we were able to take survey results from Irish households and then use those results to inform an energy model that, and depending on how those preferences are encoded, it will shift the, the deployment pattern that we see across Ireland. And I think this is really novel work, again, to combine um, the survey work with the, the energy modeling work to better understand how the system will develop uh, in the future. Okay, and then uh, final slide here is just some high level insights and in, in outcomes from the project. So we were able to model low carbon and high renewable scenarios, and we found that both lead to a significant rise in, in distributed renewables. We find that the energy system models push to decarbonize the electric sector and then electrify end use sectors. When we look across the, um, the, the different models, we find that in 2050, when we're looking at electrification of service demands, so this is basically, you know, what fraction of final energy is being met by, by electricity. We find that in Ireland, it's between about 15 and 65%. In, and in the United States, it's between 45 and 80%. And we see this wide range because it really depends on the specific scenario assumptions we make when we're conducting the analysis. It, it's also worth mentioning that um, in many of the scenarios, the decarbonization pathways also rely on things besides just renewables and um, and end use electrification. So as an example, a uh, biomass, as well as hydrogen production, which can be used, the hydrogen hydrogen can be used directly or be used to make um, synthetic fuels. So again, depending on the scenario, we see uh, use of, of these other pathways as well. Uh, as I mentioned, we also develop methods to assess public preferences and then develop the method to take those, uh, those assessment of public preferences via surveys and then actually incorporate them into energy system models to see how it affects the, the results. And then finally, we were able to advance the design of secure communications methods to support the wide-scale deployment of distributed wind and solar generation. And that's all I have. I'm going to turn it back to uh, Brian. Thank you very much, Joe. That, that provides a very, a very useful uh, overview of the project, picking out some of the, the research highlights and uh, also the work packages and the, and the content. Um, and we'll see elements of that in more detail uh, throughout the other presentations. But before the next presentation, uh, I'd like to call on one of our industry advisory committee members. It's, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Mark McGranigan, who's the VP for uh, Technology Innovation at EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. And EPRI have been with us from the start on this project uh, as one of our core uh, industry advisory panel members. And it's, it's interesting that the role that EPRI had was probably unique on our committee in the sense that we, we drew on industry advisors from the US and Ireland and EPRI has a foot in, in both jurisdictions. So uh, that added to their contribution. So Mark, over to you for some reflections, please. That's great, Brian. Thanks a lot. I uh, really appreciate that. I've really enjoyed uh, being an advisor on the, on the Credence uh, project and um, particularly enjoyed seeing the recognition in the Credence video of the creation of our EPRI Europe uh, presence and office, which happened during the uh, period of the Credence project. I think participating in that is, you know, really helped uh, establish our presence here and we're really delighted to have an official Irish company that we can part, you know, participate even closer in Irish research activities as well as activities throughout Europe. So that's really exciting for us. I thought uh, Joseph's comments were, were right on target. I really appreciated the four, the four uh, high level takeaways and, and I'll, I'll just reflect on, on those briefly. I think that uh, 
at, at a high level that in this energy systems research area, the findings here are really reflective of what we're finding in, in the industry overall, mainly that we can we, we can't look at the electric system in isolation anymore. Everything is about energy system analysis and it, it involves complex systems and systems of systems, uh, multiple energy systems, customers, buildings, electric transportation, communities, weather systems, as well as government policies and technology development and the interactions between all these systems are, are really bringing new challenges around data and modeling uh, to, to our, uh, our, our research needs. And, and I think Credence started to, to tackle some of those and, and sets the stage for ongoing work in those areas. I think uh, it also uh, highlights the strong collaboration between all the stakeholders. So I'll just mention three high level things that takeaways that both from Joseph's comments and, and from the, uh, the years involved in the in the being an advisor to Credence overall, I think uh, first of all that the energy transition strategies and challenges really are global challenges. That coordination of research across uh, for electric system regulatory environments, social policies are different, but the challenges that we face in this space for decarbonization and uh, integration of, of distributed resources and the digitalization challenges are, are really the same everywhere. And uh, having this, this collaboration has been particularly valuable in, in emphasizing that, but, and also dealing with that. Um, secondly, the challenges are really a combination of technical challenges and policy challenges. And this project in particular really focused on informing policy based on technical issues. And that collaboration, I think we're, you're a little bit ahead on that here in Ireland and in Europe. And so learning from, from that, that process of technical research informing policy is something that, that uh, we could bring back to the States and, and learn a little bit from. So that's been particularly valuable as we go down this path where communities, energy justice, uh, relationship between different energy systems and the role of all the different stakeholders all involve policy decisions. And that leads to the third item, which is really the critical role of the community um, in the success of the energy transition. We're seeing that in the US in a big way, we're working on net zero energy communities to work at the Freedom Center around microgrids. The uh, all is is critical to the energy transition going forward. Um, community priorities, resiliency in particular, but efficiency, energy justice um, are, all, are all absolutely critical. And they actually have to become part of our data and modeling challenges as we, as we work on this, this research. So I think that we're seeing it in Dingle um, here in Ireland with the engagement of the community and how we deal with resiliency as well as integration of distributed resources. So learning a lot from that. And I think there'll be a continued strong opportunity for sharing in that space. So thanks again for, for this the great opportunity to, to participate. And I look forward to where this goes from here. So thanks a lot, Brian. Thank you very much, Mark. I, I really appreciate those uh, reflections uh, on our research. And some of the themes that you touched on in terms of informing policy engagement with community uh, will uh, continue throughout the course of, of, of uh, the, the both sessions today. So thank you very much for that, for your contribution. I appreciate it very much. Uh, the next presentation is from uh, Dr. Aoife Foley from Queen's University in Belfast. And the title of Aoife's presentation is The Dynamic Impacts of Renewable Generation and Emergent Smart Loads on the Power System. So we'll focus on that. Over to you, Aoife.
Hi, Brian, can you see my slides? Yes, they're in presenter mode. Oh, yeah, just two seconds, stop sharing. And uh, I'm not a Zoom person. There we go, I'd say that's it, yeah. Okay, share. So um, actually I sort of changed my title this morning, Brian, so sorry for, um, forget, I never updated you. <laughs> Brian's well used to me. Um, so what I'm actually gonna talk about is the work, the work that's come out of Credence and some of the ongoing work from Credence um, with um, Dilar, one of my PhD students and Dr. Laverty, who's gonna to talk to you in a while. Um, I'm going to bring in some of my newer work and how it all fits into Credence and fits into the wider activities in Northern Ireland, in the UK and on the island of Ireland. So the title for me um, of my presentation is Greening the United Kingdom to a Net Zero Carbon Future. Um, what sort of is relevant to Credence in terms of the, the key policy documents for me, I suppose, at the heart of it is what's happening in the UK, Net Zero Contribution to Stop Global Warming. Um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Paris COP21, um, and the European Green Deal. Now, where does this take us? And we know we're going to have different levels of technology cuts, uh, emissions cuts based on technology moving forward into the future. But the issue for us really is, you know, we're a society where we're consumer driven. And that's really at the heart of my research. It's all about the technology. How can we get technology out there and how can we make jobs and employ engineers and make money out of it in terms of um, deployment in the ground? OK, so on the street, in people's home and get people to change, to cut emissions. And um, I like to use um, Veruca Salt from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory because she's the lady who wanted everything now. Um, now, in terms of the key policy driver then and energy, world energy consumption is going to, to drive up globally. So our project really not alone should it make impact in the EU and the British Isles and in the USA, it should also make impact in Asia, um, India and China. And I have colleagues I'm working with there trying to bring some of that, the work that we're doing here over to that part of the world because they are actually far bigger polluters then Ireland or, or, or Europe really in, in population sense. So non-OECD countries as well as OECD countries are very, very important. And they're in a different place to us in terms of technology development, even just for rural electrification. So we think COVID is a problem at the moment. Um, and I'm sure we all realize that actually COVID is only the preliminary round of um, the effects and impacts of global warming. Now, the thing about um, policies are they're really, really important. And we get to a state in our societal development where we have plenty of policies, but actually what we need to do is we need to send the heavy lifters out onto the pitch. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not an American football lady, but I know all about rugby. So I like to send the guys who are going to be in the, in the front row out and they're going to push the ball over the line when you're on the line and get that trophy and, and win the match. So it's really about the technology development. And it's not just ignore the dialogue in relation to climate change being a hoax and getting irate and upset with people who have very unusual opinions. We must focus on, on the end, on the end line and, and achieving emissions reductions and, and keeping people in gainful employment and protecting the environment. So for me, what, what we need to do is we need to mind this gap. So what we have at the moment is we have a $1.6 trillion deficit that we're going to have in different sectors of the economy. And what we seem to be focusing on is some technologies that may not deliver until further down the track. So in terms of carbon capture and storage, in terms of um, hydrogen and in terms of small nuclear. So the thing about it is everybody doesn't need to agree with me and what I'm going to say in terms of the research I'm going to present in a minute. But the most important thing is that you're open, that I'm open to criticism in what I say and that actually no model is infallible and it's only there to inform. So always be aware of models, because if you don't watch your model, you're going to forget your system and the lights are going to go out. So we know it's about low carbon technologies and they actually all exist. So we know that hybrid electric and hydrogen biofuels, lightweighting, internal combustion engine efficiency through catalysis and other means. Um, 
advanced industry energy use technology, building management systems, electric heat pumps, onshore and offshore, um, wind, solar thermal, solar PV, all these technologies are there. But there's other technologies such, such as district heating, smart appliances in the home. They're really the next generation of technologies that need to be brought into the marketplace like mobile phone networks back in the noughties. So what did I do in the work with my um, students? So what we looked at was power system dynamics and we focused on distributed generation penetration. So we're looking at the interface between the transmission system and the distribution system. And we did that by modeling um, a 39 bus IEEE system with energy storage. And then we also looked at it, ironically enough, we started doing this about a year and a half ago, two years ago, we started looking at data centers. So this is something that actually a lot of people have been seeing before and I'm gonna present some new information today. So the key findings, so first of all, we built the model and we, we, we calibrated and validated it against some events that happened in the Irish system over the last number of months. Um, and then what we did was we looked at different um, ancillary services, um, rock off, um, primary, secondary, tertiary, um, synchronous um, reserve, and we looked at the system in, in, in depth um, in a, a dynamic model and we also looked at it statically. And what we've discovered is that basically um, demand response to make a significant um, impact to the power system, um, the, the, it needs to contribute system frequency nadder and rock off with a response time within inertial response interval of about 0.3 seconds. So that was the first thing that we really think is very, very important that I'd like to share with you today. The next thing we've looked at is we've looked at um, data centers on the island of Ireland. And I think this is very, very important for countries like Iceland, for um, Denmark, who's um, in commissioning and building and rolling out their data centers, data centers in Asia, and indeed also in the United States, um, how wind and data centers can work together using UPS and their um, air conditioning HVAC systems. So the thing here we, we've realized is that um, increasing level of wind penetra penetration um, in a system with data centers and high wind penetrations, the potential impact of um, inertial response on the system um, frequency, that increases the, the nadder. And like, I mean, it's quite obvious from um, AirGrid over the last few weeks when they've come out and spoken about it. So this is really, really important. So wind power generation and data centers they will highly affect frequency, okay? So how can we deal with that? And that's what we've been looking at. We've been looking at how can we create a new ancillary service so that we don't stop the rollout of um, data centers. And if anybody's interested in emailing me on it, I can share some of the, 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 the results of our study and our analysis in terms of rock off and configuring um, the data centers. So, Next then, other work that led on to, um, we've been led on to as a result of Credence is um, offshore wind. So one of my students at the moment, Barry Johnson, he's doing um, a study looking at um, levelized cost of energy and we're linking that to the wholesale, um, new, um, wholesale electricity market on the island of Ireland um, to give us an idea of strike price. So I'm gonna cut right to the chase um, we're going we're gonna to link hard link, not soft link, Plexus and an LCOE model, um, as you can see here. And this will give us an idea of the auction price and the strike prices. And I hope that will inform both Northern Ireland policy making and decision making and also um, decision and policy making in the Republic of Ireland. Um, we looked at costs. We looked at the UK, um, at GB, the GB market initially in terms of um, CapEx breakdowns. Um, then we looked at capacity factor estimations on the island of Ireland using um, weather buoys. Um, and then we pulled all this together to estimate our LCOEs. And then what we also did was we looked at changes in CapEx increasing by 20%, cost reductions of 20%, carbon offsetting and capacity factor um, increases. And what we've discovered or what we've estimated, and we're publishing this piece of work at the moment, is that um, we estimate a baseline LCOE of 115 euros per megawatt hour on the island of Ireland. So that's one piece of work. And Barry now is developing it over the summer, looking at um, the unit commitment and the ISIN and that strike price and auction price and how we can vary it. 
So another one of my students, um, he's sponsored by Department for Economics and um, the Economy in Northern Ireland, DEFI, is um, Alistair. And Alistair is looking at retail business models for decentralized heating and cooling loads. So we, the heart of credence is decentralization. But the challenge and the issue for me coming from the telecommunications sector when I worked in the private sector is that we don't have a transparent retail electricity market. And if we want to deploy large volumes of technology, smart appliances, smart meters in the home, electric vehicles, the interlinking of the wholesale and the retail markets need to change fundamentally. So I have Alistair looking at that at the moment. And we've started looking at um, a case study in Northern Ireland and looking at um, heating. OK, so um, we've started to look at that and we have some interesting results that we can also share with you. And then the next person is Harrison and Harrison is working for um, doing a piece of work with SSE. And what we're looking at is how do we change customer engagement um, in future retail electricity markets? And um, again, you can see here what we're going to try and do is um, look at blockchain and microgrids and how we, we create these new um, business model structures, because the gap is the finance and the investment. How can you how can you make a smart meter viable for the um, distribution system and what services can the distribution system? So the DNO, so the likes of um, ESB networks, OK, in the Republic, how can we make those um, services viable for them to charge a price for um, the flow of electricity along their network if it's being used for other purposes, you know, localized balancing, et cetera. So um, Alistair has start, or Harrison has started his work. And again, he'll be using Plexus to do elements of this. And again, we are expanding out um, Plexus to use to do some retail analysis. So we're going down to a different level in the model that currently exists for unit commitment on the island of Ireland. So then this led me to consider a year and a half ago um, energy poverty. And I contacted um, Professor Benjamin Sovacall over in Sussex and I put a piece of work to him and he was very interested in it. And it linked in nicely to um, our credence work as well. And ironically, I think it was ESB, um, our electricity announced there um, about three weeks ago or four weeks ago that they were going to um, work with Cluid and the housing agency on, um, in the Republic of Ireland to um, you know, dump excess wind energy. So actually we've been looking at that as one of, the, one of the options to remove energy poverty in Northern Ireland. And we've produced some interesting work in it. And we're trying to bring the metrics together to do a cost benefit analysis of this for policymakers. So how can they justify this to their, you know, their minister in their department if they're, um, if they're working civil servants? So we're also looking at transport and energy because transport energy is a huge issue for people who are in a poverty trap. Um, and then my last um, student who I'm going to talk about is Neil. He's the elder lemon of the group and his beautiful daughter got married last Friday. And what Neil is looking at, he, he worked for ASE for years in Larn, and what he's looking at is ancillary services um, and, and, and making a business case at the distribution level and we've started to, to look at um, different parts of Northern Ireland and, and what hours would be available and what money we could make to, to go back to the regulator and say, look, this, this is what we can do in terms of flexing and different viable solutions for energy storage. So that's basically it um, in terms of that work. Then this led into a further piece of work with Professor Benjamin Sovacall when I was asked to join the Industrial Decarbonisation Research and Innovation Centre. So I'm really proud of this opportunity because this is 141 partners in the British Isles and um, it has £9.7 million worth of funding. And what we're going to be doing is basically the tech to decarbonise. Um, and I'm the little dot there in Northern Ireland. Um, and just to give you an idea of the work we're going to be doing, um, you know, it's everything really that Credence is, but at a much larger scale and really bringing in the technology, inc including carbon capture and storage. Um, and as you can see, you know, all the major um, groups in the UK are represented there. So you have the hydrogen, you have the supergen, you have um, CREDS, which is the policy group, 
and you have the UK Energy Research Centre, who I would be affiliated with. So um, there's just one thing I want to say here, and I think it's really, really important. OK, so we're sort of at a crossroads at the moment in terms of technology. We're in a, a, a transition phase. And to me, this is like going back, you know, over 100 years ago um, when they went from the horse and cart to, to, to the internal combustion engine. Um, and if we go back to the mobile phone rollout, so one time in, 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 in one time that really stands out to me is when we sold off the mobile phone networks on the island of Ireland and in the UK. Um, and I think um, Margaret Thatcher led that at the time and it was a great success. And I think something like that really needs to be done in the retail electricity sector for us really to realise full decarbonisation. Otherwise, we're not going to have a business case. Banks will only invest when there's a business case. And I put that in context of 12 years industry experience. So these technologies need to take off. So we've seen it with wind. We've seen it with offshore wind and GB. We've seen it with solar all over the world. They need to take off. Um, we're, we're down here and we're laboring around down here. We need, we need to get up here. And this will create hundreds of thousands of jobs all over the world. Um, and it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, the one thing that we need to be careful of is we wouldn't want the market to collapse like happened with solar PV a number of years ago, because that's quite dangerous. We need to manage the market carefully. The other thing I want to flag up to everybody is um, something that struck with me from a talk that I heard from Bill Gates. Energy, this is the investment R&D spend as a percentage of say, um, share of sales. So 0.42%. So look at pharmaceuticals, it's 20%. You look at the aerospace and defence industry now. Pharmaceuticals are great, but when down street, when Wall Street, downtown New York is a half a metre underwater and you have an issue, I don't think your pharmaceuticals are going to save us. So I think we really need to invest more in the energy sector and the automotive and the aerospace sector. OK, um, this is where we are. We're pushing back and forth there when we need to breach it. And I'm going to end on um, a hero of mine, a note from um, Henry Ford, a good Cork man. And my grandfather worked in Fords in England for 32 years, and I'm a Cork woman. So ideas of themselves are extraordinarily valuable, but an idea is just an idea. Almost anyone can have an idea. The thing that counts is developing it into a practical product. And that's where we are at the moment. And that's hopefully where I'm going to bring that my work in the next few years, is to realize that vision that I had starting back in 2009, when I got my EPA award as a, a climate change fellow working with Professor Brian O'Gallagher, and just I'd like to really realise some success in terms of technology deployment. And that's why I'm ending on this slide. This is the sector that we can learn from. OK, now, the one thing that I disagree with with a lot of people is when I hear people say we have to half our energy. If we start saying we're going to half energy, it means we can't make a business case. What we need to do is make energy more efficient and reduce emissions. OK, so thank you very much for your patience and I hope you enjoyed my talk. And I'd also like to thank um, DEFI and NSF and SFI for supporting this great research project over the last few years. Thanks very much, uh, Aoife. That was very much a, a whistle-stop tour across the, the Credence project and where it's taken you uh, into uh, beyond Credence. Thank you very much for that. It, it focused on the some of the software and modeling side of things. And now we're going to switch to the uh, hardware side of, of Credence with a presentation from your colleague in Queen's University, Belfast, uh, David Laverty, who's going to talk about the novel use of open hardware to assess electrical power quality. Over to you, David. Hello, uh, thank you very much, Brian. Um, let me see, uh, there's my video. Great. So, um, yes, uh, on the flip side from the various modeling activities that we've been uh, doing as part of Credence, my work has largely been in the area of uh, instruments that will be installed across the grid for uh, collecting data and then also the transport of that data, uh, which will feed forward into the models and for various uh, uh, analytical tools. So to uh, set this scene for my presentation, um, I want to address why we're interested in measuring electrical power, 
what can this tell us and why the direction of travel towards open hardware and uh, I've thrown in this picture of myself because if you google my name I'm now cursed forever that you'll see these pictures of me with an electric car that I built um, out of a DeLorean. Anyway we already measure electricity so what's new? You know, if uh, we go and look uh, in our meter boxes or under the stairs or out in the garage, we'll find that there are already, already instruments that the utility has kindly provided us. And these serve the purpose of counting the number of kilowatt hours of energy that we've used so that they can send us a bill at the end of the day. Um, there's also been an awful lot of talk recently about the direction of travel towards smart meters but what do smart meters really do? Well, they provide a greater granularity in the terms of the number of kilowatt hours that we've used, but still nothing uh, really earth shattering uh, new in that regard. They also often provide the utility, the ability to turn your power off remotely, but uh, that's generally not acceptable to the consumer. So uh, that's something that um, we'll not be exploring too much. So, what has changed is that uh, the way we use the electricity network has radically altered over the last number of decades. We are installing increasing amounts of uh, solar generation, photovoltaics, such as this one um, down in County Cork. We're also seeing a tremendous growth in um, wind generation. And on the load side, there's lots of changes. There's things like heat pumps. There's generally the ever-growing ICT load. But uh, one of the biggest changes that we're seeing over the last decade um, is the growth in demand from electric vehicles. Now, there's all sorts of other things that have glossed over in this in terms of, you know, battery energy storage and vehicle to grid and all things like that. But principally, we can say that uh, there are two big changes. There's now embedded generation and there are uh, dramatic increases in the demand on the system. Bearing in mind that the electricity grids that we've inherited can often be quite old, there are a number of problems that arise from this. So where I'm sitting um, in Belfast at the moment, the electricity grid in this neighbourhood was built in the 1950s. That's actually quite young for some parts of the city. Many parts of the city, the grid would have been uh, built in the 1930s and is still in use today. So it's pushing 100 years old. We see this same thing uh, across many different countries, uh, United States included, where uh, engineers in the past had uh, forecast that there would be growth in demand and their uh, designs have stood the test of time, have been operating very successfully, but uh, they couldn't have foreseen these really dramatic changes in use case. So what this is uh, causing is that if we get uh, houses that start to have you know, solar panels um, in, uh, on their roofs and they're starting to feed power backwards up the electrical grid, that can create all sorts of problems in terms of voltage regulation. It can create hotspots and transformers, all sorts of unpleasantness can arise. And then as well, if we start to put in electric vehicles and parts of the grid and we've got very dramatic increases in load going downstream, it can make the challenges of uh, uh, operating the system really quite incredible. Unfortunately, the solutions don't completely generalize because electrical networks vary in topology uh, for a number of reasons. They vary on uh, uh, continental scales, like the topology of electrical networks in the United States would differ greatly from those in Europe. But even on a local scale, uh, the um, topology of electrical networks in uh, say Belfast would be rather different to what you would see in Dublin. And that just uh, comes from the uh, different uh, industrial heritage of the two cities and all sorts of nuances like that. So we can't have a totally generalized solution. So what we need to do is we need to actually measure what's going on in these grids and develop an understanding of the uh, uh, particular nature of what we're looking at. Well, when I talk to many engineers about this who are not familiar with the electrical utility space, they think, well, sure, that's fine. Like, you know, obviously the utility will have detailed records. Well, yes, uh, for um, a piece of infrastructure like uh, this picture here, we've got a pole mount transformer with some other stuff going on. There'd be fuses and interrupters and things like that. Yeah, the utility will have documentation for that. 
but very often it's in a very non-electronic form. It's often in, stored in, in paper drawings, you know, depending on when this thing was installed. If it was installed in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, probably going to be in a paper format. Um, it might not even be uh, diagrammatical. It might be uh, written up in some sort of text form. As we move into the 90s and the noughties, you know, we start to get electronic things, but then all the formats can be different. There's, yeah, it's complicated. So basically what we're, we're dealing with here is a, a real problem of where the information exists, it might not really be machine readable. It might be, not be something that our computers can easily process. So again, we're back to what can we measure off the actual infrastructure? What we would like to achieve is this holy grail of smart grids, which enables all things such as uh, consumer participation, renewable energy, markets and trading. We want to enhance the reliability and enhance the power quality of our grid. And on top of all this, we want it to be self-optimizing so that it can deal with these emerging challenges as growth in PV and wind, et cetera, increases. And on top of all this, we need it to be cyber secure. It's not easy. There's a heck of a lot going on in that diagram um, that uh, maybe in the Q&A we can explore some of. So here's an example piece of network. This is uh, up in the, the north of Ireland. This is in Donegal. It's actually in the Republic. But, uh, part of my network here straddles into Northern Ireland, so it is cross-border. Um, and what we've done here is we've modeled a section of network and we've applied phaser measurement units to this to understand what's going on. And the bizarre thing is that at the time that we did this study, this is early on in credence, this is about 2016-17, this small section of the island of Ireland here uh, produced so much wind power that if we listed it uh, on an international scale, this would have been the 21st largest producer of wind power in the world, uh, this little section of network. And the thing is, all of that power has to feed out these uh, rather weak electrical lines here back out into the rest of the Irish grid. So it creates all sorts of problems. But what we did in this study, we were able to identify lots of interesting things. I'll not go into the technical details of it, but we used these big box machines called phaser measurement units that reveal the details. That was great, but it's not going to scale down to individual homes and individual electric cars and things like that. And uh, I'm going to skip this slide just for the sake of time, but just suffice to say that uh, sometimes uh, the measurement process can be a bit complicated. You can see all sorts of oddball things happening. The motivation for going open source is twofold. Firstly, commercially available instruments are black boxes. What I, mean, what, what I mean by that is that the function of that equipment isn't known to the end user. Uh, basically, they're uh, treated by their vendors as uh, closely guarded secrets. Um, problem with that is that sometimes uh, the input output of these boxes can be a bit ambiguous for uh, a given signal in um, what comes out. Normally is predictable, but when you get a sort of a strange event happening on the system, you sometimes can't predict what the box is going to tell you. So what we need is to have a new form of instruments where the inner workings of that instrument are totally transparent. That means that researchers can study exactly what is going on from the input of the instrument to the output of the instrument. And through this mechanism, it's going to promote new ideas and lead to novel applications. So what we did as part of Credence was we developed uh, this modular design of a tool called OpenPMU, which is the Open Source Phaser Measurement Unit. So we've created this open source piece of hardware. It's uh, based on a platform called BeagleBone Black, which is kind of similar to a Raspberry Pi, similar sort of price point as well. And then we'll have all of these different open source uh, software applications that enable researchers to develop tools to apply to the open PMU. So it means that when a researcher is uh, studying an electrical power system and they want to identify, well, let's say they want to identify where electric vehicles are connected on the grid. What they can now do is they don't have to worry about building all of this complicated hardware and building all of the software that makes the hardware tick. They can now focus on producing the algorithm that sits in the middle that does that application of finding out where the electric vehicles are. So this is one of the PhDs uh, based at uh, QUB, 
uh, working on Credence is looking at this very problem. We're in very, very noisy signals. So this is uh, an example of the electrical demand a particular house has throughout a certain day. And during that day, the electric vehicle is charging. And in this case, it's kind of simple, you know, that we can see here clearly that, you know, here's the two points that uh, of which the electric vehicle is charging. But what we did was we used the open source tools to develop a methodology that could basically take this piece of data and filter out the sort of the, the noisy generation, uh, or sorry, the noisy electrical consumption profile of the house and find within that when the electric vehicle is charging. That was you know, a nice piece of work, but as I said, arguably, you know, you can just draw a line across there and say that there's where the electric vehicles are. Not so easy whenever you get up to an entire street. Now we have uh, the load profile of several houses. I think it was about uh, 12 different houses on this street. And in that, we are now trying to detect when individual electric vehicles are charging. And we've been very successful at that. We're up to 95% confidence in terms of detecting individual electric vehicles using these open source tools. So what does this mean? Well, back to our problem, uh, the utility doesn't necessarily have records in an electronic fashion that uh, enable a computer to, to, to develop the, uh, the electrical models very effectively. But through these measurement technologies, what we can do is we can measure the physical infrastructure that actually exists, and we can start to work out there's an electric car there. And then we find that there's more electric cars as the uh, population of electric cars in the neighborhood uh, grows. Over here with some electric cars as well. And then eventually, you know, as these become uh, mass adopted, the network is able to find out where they are. The problem that this solves for us then is how are we going to coordinate the charging of these electric vehicles to best optimize the use of low carbon energy? So um, the first thing is we need to know where the devices actually are. Second thing is we need to know what they're doing. And then the third thing is that we're going to control them. So what we're able to do with the open source technologies is we're moving up that food chain of information and we're able to start creating the, uh, the software applications that are going to aid in terms of decarbonization. The next step is the cybersecurity step. And this is where um, a lot of our uh, present funding uh, is focused that uh, as the, this uh, package of working credence comes to a close, we're now starting to look at how we make the whole system secure. So we have funding from uh, the National Cybersecurity Centre in the United Kingdom, which is looking at this. And uh, we're also looking to uh, develop new projects, um, uh, perhaps even in the US Ireland, which will look towards the cybersecurity considerations of, of operating these microgrids. So if you'd like to learn more about OpenPMU, I've put the web address up here. It's rather simple, openpmu.org. And uh, I probably should wrap up there and uh, leave any of that to the, the Q&A. Thank you very much, David. Um, we move on now from the software and the hardware to the, um, the people side of the challenge of uh, decarbonization, electrification and decentralization. I'm delighted to invite on my colleague, uh, John Curtis, um, within, from within MARI, uh, our team, who leads our team in the Economic and Social Research Institute. Um, and John is going to talk to us about the, the role of public attitudes and residential electricity consumers in renewable integration. Over to you, John. Thank you, Brian, and um, uh, good day to everyone. So uh, I'm part of the Marai Center and work at um, Economic and Social Research Institute. And as Brian says, uh, the focus of ESRI was on the softer part of the, of the, um, the sciences. Uh, we've heard earlier um, about how we can essentially engineer um, some of the solutions we need to in increase uh, the level of uh, electrification and integration of renewables in, into the system. Uh, talking about, you know, and the communications as well. Um, but I think what 
the work we're trying to do is to understand how uh, society and consumers can interact with that. Um, we saw from David's talk and earlier, we, we have uh, the time scale of some of these decisions uh, or some of these aspects of the engineering ranges from seconds uh, milliseconds up to uh, when we're thinking about policy targets in 2030 and 2050. Um, uh, these are our timescales that our electricity consumers and our wider society have to engage with um, because they ultimately, the power system is for them and they have to um, you know, accept it on their landscape and how it works for them. And uh, so that was the part of the work that um, we were looking at in Credence. On the bullets there, I have distinguished between electricity consumers and wider society. You can think of all consumers being um, uh, part of society, but society or members of the public are not all necessarily consumers. And sometimes you're both, but you wear different hats. So part of what we were trying to do in the project was um, look at those two hats, if so to speak, and see how, um, as a consumer or and in a moment as a member of the general public, how uh, your views or preferences might impact on um, the power system as we move to increase uh, whether it's electrification or renewables into um, integration into the system, how is that going to impact on whether it's gen the types of generation we have or the transmission? And you know, very briefly, if you think about just the, the consumers themselves have a load in terms of our, uh, a demand for electricity. So the scale of that will impact on how much generation and transmission is needed. Um, or if you want to think about the peak load when electricity is very, the most expensive for, for producing, um, when that occurs or whether it can be moved off the peak can have an impact. So one of the, you know, there, there are lots of research questions and things we still need to, to tackle in that area. But one of the questions we looked at in the Credence project um, focused on the residential sector and trying to understand what role uh, residential consumers, electricity consumers, could facilitate or help that uh, roll, roll out of um, uh, renewable integration. And we, we did this looking at whether uh, the idea of domestic appliance curtailment contracts so in a nutshell, the idea of that would be that at certain points of the day, usually around peak uh, load periods, whether consumers would agree not to use their appliances and there would be a whole pile of tech around how that would be implemented. But what we were looking at were the extent to which consumers would, would buy into this type of, of, of contract where they might get compensated or get reduced a bill overall for providing a service to the system. And you know, one of the things is, uh, in terms of the research is figuring out the potential for this kind of, of service. And we found um, you know, quite high levels of engagement with this. Seven out of eight households were willing to learn more. Um, but the real sort of nub of the research is try to understand not just that there's an interest in these, these type of contracts which can deliver a service to the system, but is understanding what what are the key things that will drive households and, and customers to, to undertake these contracts? And uh, some of the findings were there, the, the devices that the contracts uh, apply to or the appliances. We looked at um, electric ovens, uh, dishwashers, washing machines, that kind of thing. And uh, for most households, the idea of um, allowing their, their uh, electric oven to be curtailed at, you know, in the peak evening period when you come home and prepare your evening meal. Um, it, it didn't go down very well. And on average, uh, households would want to uh, have a, a basically be compensated for this type of contract equivalent to about one seventh of their electricity bill. So not financially viable as, 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 as an option. But for the other types of appliances, dishwashers and washing machines, um, much more financially viable from the, from the power system perspective to get some flexibility in there. But a key element of, of what we found if households were willing to do this is they want to maintain a certain level of control within their, within their um, essentially house. And by control, I mean uh, an awareness of when these curtailment events might happen because you're not signing up to never use your, your 
appliance, your, your washing machine, you know, in the peak periods, it's only when the, the system needs it maybe a few times a month or that they can opt out. If you come home some evening and you absolutely must do your laundry, you don't want the, the, the power utility telling you you can't turn on your washing machine that you have the ability to opt out. So these are the kinds of, of things that can help, um, you know, greater understanding of this can develop um, uh, policies or, or, or contract types that utilities can deploy out into the system that then will enable them to meet, you know, essentially keep, keep the lights on. So that was one example of something we were looking at. And the second one was looking at wider society. And in the earlier uh, presentation by Joe, uh, he referenced this and uh, this was some work we did on public acceptance. So often we hear when there's new uh, wind farm developments or even transmission lines, you generally or often will hear about, you may hear the investment announcement, but uh, the follow on media is often an objection to, to this. And what we were looking at in, in, in the research was um, rather than look at it from the community's um, uh, acceptance or not of, of new infrastructure, renewable infrastructure, is to look at it from the system perspective. What does this, how does this uh, uh, public acceptance impact on the operation and cost of, of, of the system? So, um, I'm just going to share some results and, and, and uh, very quickly, Joe presented some photos. But the slide we have here on the, the graphic on the left, we, we looked at different scenarios or levels of public acceptance of new transmission and wind infrastructure. And as you move from left to right of that graphic, there are declining levels of public acceptance. And uh, you know, for several scenarios, we found additional costs were relatively low, five to six percent. And we're already doing this in terms of all power systems around the world because we have planning systems and public preferences are being, in some sense, being incorporated into them. But I suppose the, the critical thing we found was at a certain point, um, if public acceptance of this new energy infrastructure, transmission lines and such, if it, if, if it gets sufficiently low, that costs will escalate quite dramatically. And, and you can see that from, from the graphic there. Um, but another way of, of presenting that is thinking, how does that impact in terms of, you know, it, it'll ultimately boil down to prices that consumers will face. So we're modeling this for, for the, the single electricity market on the island of Ireland. So we just have a single wholesale electricity price, which is reflected within inside that uh, red box at, at the extreme right. And I have three scenarios here of um, public acceptance, moving from the, the blue on the left to the right in the gray, um, you're having lower levels of public acceptance. And you can see at, at, you know, at the early stages, there's not much impact, but as you move to, to the right in the gray one, prices, uh, wholesale prices increase by about uh, 10 euro per megawatt hour. Um, on, on the system as a whole, which is quite quite a jump. So you're showing or seeing the impact of it. And um, if we had a, a regional market, that's what the rest of the graphic shows, um, prices will be higher and lower um, across some regions. And that would depend on the availability of supply of electricity and demand within those regions. But you can see there, Northern Ireland is almost to the extreme right. Um, uh, public acceptance may have a big impact there and the graphic is, the price is quite high. But on the previous slide, I mentioned, um, you know, public acceptance, you reach a certain threshold and suddenly costs will escalate. I didn't, I wasn't able to put them on this graphic because it really crowds out everything, which you now see here. And again, on the extreme right, we're seeing um, in this scenario, national average prices almost double. And it's mostly manifested in the in the Dublin region, very astronomical high prices, um, which in, in, in the context of the economy, uh, whether it's for Dublin or the economy, if if electricity and power prices go up, um, it makes the economy uncompetitive. Um, it's going to have a drag on growth. It, this is quite important stuff. The reason why Dublin is important there is because severe congestion, but it is not because the good people of Dublin are objecting to renewable or infrastructure. It, these are preferences on the system as a whole. 
and his the system impact that we're looking at here it may manifest itself in Dublin but the source of it is because of um, uh, the public's preferences for various types of renewable infrastructure. So just to wrap up then in terms of those takeaway points from, from what we were looking at, on the electricity customer side, um, you know, we may, every now and then you'll hear in the media about, you know, with uh, the advent of smart meters that David talked about, and maybe the possibility that you will get these aggregators move in and have the, the ability to do some demand side management uh, using you know customer customer loans, but what the research here is able to 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 go sort of beyond that and go into individual customers and look for where we can find opportunities among customers. Understand that we know from about you know over a hundred years there's sort of a constant demand on average from customers, but things have evolved now and lifestyle lifestyles are changing. So getting a greater understanding of when and for what customers um, have electricity needs and the flexibility that may be there. And that will help in, in, in the future electricity system. And then on the society side, I think when, like in Ireland here, there's some sort of um, uh, large projects that often make the media for, usually for, for negative, um, because then there's objections, community oppose them. And we often focus on those specific projects and, but I think what the, the, the work here demonstrates is it's not just about, you know, the acceptance of community of, uh, you know, what it would take to, to bring the community along. The research is demonstrating that it can have wider system impacts or indeed benefits. And you saw there the prices, the potential for them to escalate. In a sense, that is the benefit of making sure that you bring um, communities and the general public with, with us as we radically transform um, how we generate and transmit electricity around our economy. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, John, for those very useful insights from the, um, uh, the Credence research. Um, now the final presentation is uh, one that I'm uh, going to deliver myself. That's looking good. Okay, thanks very much, John. I, I do apologize. So um, we, we've seen some of the modeling analysis, uh, both in terms of at, at the high level, the energy systems modeling that uh, Joe talked about, the power systems modeling that Aoife reflected on, some of the hardware elements that uh, David uh, touched on, uh, and then aspects of the, uh, the societal dimension uh, that John reflected on. And essentially, a lot of these elements came together in our case study uh, where we focused on the Dingle Peninsula. The, the reason for choosing the, the Dingle Peninsula was fortuitous in terms of the, the uh, Credence project, in that as we were doing our research, the, um, uh, there were moves afoot in Dingle to effectively uh, develop and deliver a rural energy transition. So for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with uh, the Dingle Peninsula, it's down on the southwest of Ireland. It's marked in, in red there. It's a, a relatively small uh, location in terms of, uh, of population. It's, it's a, a relatively isolated part of the electricity network. There's a dispersed population. Um, a lot of holiday homes. It's a very strong tourist destination. It's been selected by Lonely Planet as one of the best experiences Ireland has to offer. And so we do end up with this uh, flux situation where it has over the winter period, a relatively low population of 12 and a half thousand, but then it increases to about a million visitors. Uh, and there's a high concentration of that during the, the summer. And the economic activity in the um, Dingle Peninsula is dominated by tourism, farming and fishing. Um, so, one of the advantages that I mentioned uh, from, from our perspective in the Credence Project was this parallel initiative at the same time that was being um, um, proposed and promoted by ESB networks. And that was to choose the, the Dingle Peninsula as an area to test out uh, new technologies. Uh, the technologies are shown in the graphic there, and they're the technologies that we've also considered in the context of Credence, namely 
distributed uh, generation, but also distributed and used technologies such as uh, EVs and uh, heat pumps. The, the smiling, happy people there are the selected few who were chosen to uh, for an ambassadors program uh, that I'll come back to, where they, they had a focus on uh, choosing technologies um, and then speaking about their experience with those technologies uh, throughout the course of a, um, a two year period. There was also solar PV trials and EV trials. So, so this project was, was happening in parallel. And one of the core dimensions of this was, as I mentioned, the ambassadors program uh, where they tested out new technologies. So uh, some of the ambassadors were, were given the uh, heat pumps and um, uh, PV panels to test out then to encourage and discuss with their neighbors. And then we were trying to track then the uh, uptake uh, of um, the technologies by their neighbors. Uh, and this is what we call diffusion one in the Dingle Peninsula, which is focuses on this um, direct, if you like, uh, adoption of technologies uh, through demonstration by neighbors and um, sharing of the information. So th this project was happening, uh, as I say, in parallel with the, uh, the Credence project. So uh, there are two elements to the work we did, um, or we are doing rather, on the Dingle Peninsula. Uh, uh, as part of the Credence uh, case study, uh, we developed some uh, modeling tools to explore how we would model the uh, low voltage and medium voltage network. Uh, this was in conjunction with one of our industry partners who you heard from earlier, uh, EPRI. And the purpose of that, was we, we have a lot of high visibility on what's happening in the transmission system, but much lower visibility on what's happening in the low voltage and medium voltage networks. And in order to understand then the impact of uh, high level penetrations of, of heat pumps, PV, solar panels, we really need to improve the modeling. And this was undertaken by a Credence team led by Barry Hayes. Um, the project on the right then, the, which kind of uh, builds on the, um, uh, the, the Credence case study being in place, but also this additional activity in the local area, uh, prompted by ESB networks, as I mentioned, but involving other partners critically on the peninsula, particularly uh, Dingle Hub, the innovation hub in Dingle, and Northeast West Kerry development. And we formed a partnership uh, called Dingle Peninsula 2030, and some of the um, research contributions uh, from our side uh, to this partnership are showing there in terms of uh, some quantification of the emissions uh, to inform decisions made by the community on the Dingle Peninsula, um, and also then active research support. Um, so how does a partnership uh, form? How can it work collect effectively? Uh, how can we evaluate uh, this technology diffusion? Uh, and also what we saw emerging, which was a wider diffusion of sustainability. Um, and finally then to develop scenarios with citizens using parish meetings uh, of the future in terms of energy and energy related CO2 emissions. So in terms of the, uh, just a small bit more on the Credence uh, Dingle case study methodology, um, you can see it here, where we um, took advantage of the EPRI open DSSS format. And we use that as the, the modeling framework in which to, to look at simulating this integration of the medium voltage and low voltage network. So um, a, a key uh, prerequisite for being able to understand how the, um, the new devices uh, will impact on the uh, electricity system. Um, and how the system can better operate then to accommodate these new devices. Um, we have a, a significant uh, uh, collaboration on this with ESB networks who provided uh, data to enable us to, uh, to organize um, and build the model effectively. Um, and then also to validate it with uh, individual uh, low voltage areas. Now, when it's presented in a schematic like this, it makes it look simple. Uh, it's, it's very complex, but it's also very, very useful. And the purpose of this, as you can see then on the right-hand side, is to help us with 
how we might determine scenarios for the future, and then do comparative analysis in terms of exploring the impacts, as I mentioned, of these new technologies uh, on the network. Here's some uh, early sample results uh, from that analysis, um, looking at some of the, um, uh, the voltage uh, profiles. Um, I, I won't go into the detail of these, uh, and if people are interested, uh, they can certainly follow up with us and we'll get more information uh, on these. Um, and then on the right hand side, some of the residential network feeders. Uh, and this, as I say, is using this uh, EPRI um, modeling software called OpenDSS. Um, the other side of the um, uh, activity in uh, the Dingle Peninsula, as I mentioned, one dimension of that was quantifying the energy use and supply uh, on the uh, peninsula. And um, the bottom there provides the reference for this, uh, for this work. And what we found is that energy use is dominated by transport. Nearly half of energy use is dominated by uh, transport. The bulk of the remainder is, is energy use in buildings, be it in home or services. And um, you can see there that the annual energy bill on the peninsula is of the order of 36 million uh, euros. On the right hand side, we see where the supply comes from, partly due to the uh, dominance in, in transport and heating, uh, oil plays a significant role. Uh, the peninsula is not served by natural gas, so we get oil and electricity and some small amounts of solid fuels and some renew renewable electricity uh, that feeds into the electricity supply coming into the uh, uh, peninsula. We also see then the annual emissions are 80,000 tonnes of CO2. So this was useful information, not only for the, um, for the community, but also for engagement we undertook with, uh, with schools. Um, so the second diffusion, as we call it, is the, um, the, the manner in which the Dingle Sustainable Energy Community was able to use this research to underpin their energy master plan. So decisions regarding the future on the peninsula. And in parallel, we worked with secondary school students to kind of tap into their interest in climate action um, by providing the, the numbers and the, the capacity uh, to explore alternative futures. So to, to harness that interest that they have and translate it into uh, proposals for action. Um, another element of the research in uh, the, the Dingle Peninsula was on the qualitative side. Um, and what we're doing here is, is effectively using uh, network mapping to try and uh, map out what is the, the social network that's emerging on the peninsula. So who is contributing to um, the developments on the peninsula? Where is the support infrastructure? And what capacity is, is the, the local community uh, tapping into? And this was also published, uh, as you can see at the bottom, where there's more information on this. So we have this interesting mix of quantitative research and qualitative research. Uh, one of the things we, we weren't expecting um, coming out of this project uh, related to this wider diffusion of sustainability was what, one of the farmers on the peninsula uh, grouped together with a number of other farmers and they um, uh, submitted an application which was approved to set up a sustainable energy community. And the focus of this uh, sustainable energy community is to um, look at the uh, low carbon energy transition for 120 dairy farms on the peninsula. And this is one of a number of key uh, unexpected uh, impacts that have come from the work on the Dingo Peninsula that have made it very exciting to see not just the individual technology adoption, but what a community can do uh, if they're provided with the, the resources uh, to harness the, uh, the effectively energies of the individuals within that community. And another example of this was the um, establishment of a community energy mentor course by Kerry College, uh, delivered in late 2019. Uh, and this course effectively promoted, um, it was training the, the mentors uh, in the promotion of energy technologies at community level. And it critically uh, met the need for mentors from within the community. 
Um, there's a very different experience that people have in a community if they've got somebody coming in from the outside advising them on technologies uh, compared with if it's one of their neighbours. So these wider diffusions of sustainability that have emerged from this project uh, make it very exciting. Um, so in conclusion, um, what we've seen on the Dingle Peninsula is the, the trialing of technologies and, and Credence has had a, a critical role in trying to understand and map the electricity network implications of those. And then we have this wider uh, impact emerging from the, um, the parallel project uh, of the Dingle Peninsula 2030, which was able to leverage the Credence research and, um, and build further activity uh, on the societal uh, as well as the, the, uh, the engineering side. And some of the, the uh, aspects we're now considering is how can these gains be maximized? How can we feed some of the learnings from the Dingle Peninsula into national policy decisions, for example? Uh, and also, how can we align rural development that tends to fund community development projects uh, with climate action? And, and that concludes uh, that presentation uh, on the um, uh, Dingle Peninsula uh, project. Uh, I'm very happy to take any, take any questions during the, the Q&A. Now, let's see where we are in the context of time. So uh, what I'd like to do is we, we have some uh, additional industry responses that I'd like to share with you from our industry advisory committee. Uh, we have one from Bob Hanna, who is the chair of Smart Grid Ireland and the former chief technical officer in the Department of Energy in Ireland. Uh, we have a reflection from Aoife McEvely, who's the current chairperson of the Commission for the Regulation of Utilities. And we also have a reflection from Claire Duffy, who's the Network Development and Electrification Manager with ESB Networks. Uh, and then we will have a, a short bit of time for uh, Q&A uh, that Aoife will lead. Uh, but let's first um, uh, hear those reflections from our industry uh, participants. Ambassador, Credence team, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honour and pleasure to join you for this marvellous Credence Showcase event. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm taking this opportunity to chip in and say how much this event means to me, how much this project means to me and the work that I've represented. I'm wearing two hats here. I was a member of the Industry Advisory Committee. I also was a former Chief Technical Advisor to the Energy Minister when this project got going and the first talks were held in 2015. But I'm now Chair of Smart Grid Ireland, which is an industry association networking cluster. And we have needs and the department and the government have needs. And this project is a unique celebration of what can be done when you get people together in the same project with encouragement from industry to get things done. So I'd just like to highlight a few things that meant uh, that we can see the way forward. First of all, this provides a pathway to the future that we all aspire to. Many other processes have provided an end result, but not the pathway. In bringing together the disciplines of researchers that have focused on decentralization of energy systems and electrification of heat and transport, you have between the two jurisdictions, the three jurisdictions, depending on your point of view, come with results which are valid and real, and this pathway means something. The outputs will help um, energy system planning, uh, they will help electric system design, and they'll help electric system uh, operation in the near term as well as in the long term, and that's really important. I'm pleased to represent the industry partners who need answers to these questions, not just where are we going, but tell us about the journey. You've done things which touch the energy system at all levels. The Dingle project, the way you supported that, how community based enterprises can get the information that they need to make the transition project work. I was very struck by the output of the research team in US and in Ireland. I counted something like 31 papers, published peer reviewed papers during the course of the project and something like 16 conference publications. 
this is immense for one project. And it, it is a testament both to the quality of the work and the way the work was structured and what could be done within this project. So way much work to do. I hope you find a way to encapsulate the learning that you've achieved presented to us in a way that we can use it. And I hope there's a future for this work. Well done to everybody involved with Credence and onwards and upwards. Thank you. So I'd like to thank, first of all, Brian O'Gallagher and all of the team who worked so hard on Credence. Uh, the project has been of immense interest uh, to us all in the Commission for Regulation of Utilities. Uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to participate personally at some of the meetings, and I know some of my colleagues and directors and others did too. It's just fascinating and also incredibly relevant to what we're trying to do in Ireland. So the focus on electrification of heating and transport along with decentralization is hugely aligned with the work that Ireland is undertaking under the Climate Action Plan. And I suppose also part of the vision that the Commission for Regulation Util of Utilities also has uh, for protecting and empowering consumers and ensuring a secure low carbon transition. Uh, I, I, I found just a couple of aspects of the Greens project um, particularly interesting. Uh, firstly, uh, it was a multidisciplinary in nature of the work. So uh, we would have seen um, so, sort of very high level uh, analysis of the national approach, let's say, to achieving um, zero carbon electricity by 2050. Um, but then also some really good um, work on the ground, let's say, through the Dingle project. Uh, thinking about, well, what does this actually mean in people's lives rather rather than just having the information on the spreadsheet? It, it, it actually went down to, you know, the acceptability of some of the, the infrastructure that's needed to achieve those targets. And it brought the reality, if you like, of, of the practical realities of trying to deliver a very different type of electricity sector and the different types of infrastructure that might be needed um, and, and the impact it will have on people's lives together, which is unusual, I think, and unique possibly uh, for, for this project. I found also hugely interesting was the uh, insight that we got into other jurisdictions, particularly the American um, crossover, if you like, added huge value to the project. And finally, I think one of the areas that was really important for us in CRU is uh, I, I suppose getting the involvement of our network operators and system operators in Ireland because uh, we know the level of change that's needed over the next 10, 20, 30 years it is so great and we can't just do the same things. We're going to have to do things differently. We have been incentivizing and funding innovation and research for the network operators because we believe that's in the best interests of consumers and we've really encourage them not to make that all in-house, but to, to go outside and to work with others and to work with international projects exactly like this. I think it was really heartening to see the likes of ESB Networks, uh, GNI, Airgrid, um, participating in, in the Credence project. So overall, I think uh, part of our focus now is embedding those learnings. Um, we can see some of the key targets in our climate action plan. Um, being influenced by the, the research from this project. Um, but now I think what will be really interesting is seeing some of the solutions that will help us achieve those targets being embedded in the work programs of our network companies, because I think that that's how we'll get it done on the ground. So uh, overall, again, just thanks to all concerned and thanks for the opportunity to participate. Hello, my name's Claire Duffy and I work for ESB Networks as the Network Development and Electrification Manager. So we are a regulated utility that is the sole owner and operator of the electricity distribution network and the sole owner of the transmission network in the Republic of Ireland. In my role, I'm leading out on activities that are key to Ireland's transition to a lower carbon economy, specifically the connection of renewable energy, our strategy to facilitate increased electrification of heat and transport, and our innovation strategy to find new solutions to support the energy transition to a low carbon future. I'm pleased to speak to you today about how we have been working with our partner Marai and how their involvement with Credence has played into that. 
So for us, very much the focus of credence on key dimensions of the low carbon energy transition are really well aligned with what ESB Network's innovation strategy is set out to do. For us, our interests were clearly around the um, the uh, move by future customers to electrify their heat and transport. And we're interested to understand how that might happen in Ireland and what we might need to do to future proof our network. Um, we're also very interested on the, the, the move by um, customers towards becoming more active energy citizens as we look to decentralize and democratize the energy system. As the electricity network owner and the system operator, we need to ensure that our network is ready for this revolution. In particular, we need to be able to repurpose our low voltage passive network, which was designed for different times. The Dingle Electrification Project is one of our flagship innovations. It's located on the southeastern seaboard of Ireland with all the ravages of the Atlantic coastline and the weather. It has a both, um, both a small urban network and the broader rural network across the peninsula. It's a five million euro three year project where essentially it's a test bed location for us where we work with the local community and our customers to trial clusters of low carbon technology in real world situations. So where real customers are installing the equipment and we in ESB networks get to understand um, how consumer behavior um, towards the technologies might change and learn about the impacts on our distribution system. For us, I suppose a main interest of this is understanding what might be the enablers and blockers of this transition to what we term the active energy citizen mindset and the behaviours um, of citizens across the Dingle Peninsula. Of course, we're an engineering based organisation, so for us it was great to partner with our colleagues in Marai um, under the leadership of Brian O'Gallagher and Claire Watson and working with the team such as Evan Boyle and Connor Boyle, trying to understand um, what works and what doesn't work, particularly with the Marai team who are, have this expertise in social research and they're able to help us assess and evaluate what is working in terms of mobilising people to become active energy citizens. For us, I suppose the main areas that Marai has provided um, benefits have been around helping us quantify the energy use and the energy related emissions on the Dingle Peninsula, evaluating how the trials with the local customers and our energy ambassadors are going in terms of their acceptance of the technology, what has encouraged them to take up the technologies and uh, whether their behaviour has changed and monitoring and understanding not only the technology adoption, but the wider diffusion um, of sustainability within um, the community and within the, the project area. So already we're beginning to see um, early signs that attitudes are changing once you give people an opportunity to trial the technology. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Marai for being such proactive partners. And uh, we're really looking forward to closing out the project this year in 2021 and, and wanting to be able to be in a position to be able to share the learnings and the social research and find out what it, what it is that has been working in Dingle and look to share those learnings with sustainable energy communities um, around Ireland and more broadly with our stakeholders. Um, I'm going to open the floor now, I think, to um, the panellists and um, the, the guest members, just for a few minutes, if anybody has any questions on the talk so far. I have one question I received via email, um, and it refers to my presentation and then um, to John, Brian and Joe's. Um, how do the um, speakers um, see um, a decentralised energy system leading to more transparency. Well, maybe right. if, if I come in first, it's a very um, that's a very open question uh, in terms of um, I suppose it depends what's meant by transparency. Uh, certainly, the uh, the transition to a um, decentralized system can involve much more participation uh, by individuals, uh, be it in terms of the, their contribution as came out in John's research in terms of their willingness to engage as uh, active participants as end users, uh, but also in terms of their capacity to uh, become effectively energy suppliers. So 
I, I would certainly see a, a significant increase in the uh, participation of uh, individuals and citizens in the energy system, um, the, if that's what's meant. But um, uh, I'll, I'll pass over to others then to see what their reflections are. I might jump in just as a, with a comment, Mark McGranigan, that I think that that participation do, does involve more transparency kind of across the board. In the UK, you see a project that they call the Open Networks Project to, to be able to, to share information about the networks with multiple stakeholders. And as, as individuals and communities are going to participate in providing flexibility, that kind of means that we have to have a transparency about where the constraints are and our plans for the future grid so that those plans can take into account resources that are in customer facilities. So I, I think overall, it, it means a, a new level of openness and transparency, you know, when you need to have all these different stakeholders participating in the solutions. Um, uh, Jordi Carolis, would you like to add any comments or John to that um, open question? I don't really think I have anything new to add. I, I generally agree with with what they're saying that you know if we move to a system that is more more decentralized and consumers are more active participants in in the system, then I do see higher levels of transparency almost as a requirement in order to get pe people to participate. I think if people are going to participate as prosumers, they need they need some clarity on on the system and and the pricing. And, and if I could just add on that. Um, I think we're already seeing it. If we cast our mind back to 10, 20, 30 years ago, things were decided and they appeared. And now we have public consultations. Uh, there's open engagement with stakeholders and especially the public. And I think that is moving to like, obviously the, you can't have everything transparent because there's you know private information and the like, but having an openness of discussion helps us move together. So I think that's already underway and probably will continue to evolve. Okay, um, I suppose that's for that's a real regulatory issue um, and, and having that level of transparency and that's something nobody has yet. And I suppose um, a comment for myself is in Spain, they attempted to do something like that with um, solar PV, rooftop solar PV and the same in Germany. And it led to cannibalization of the wholesale market. So I suppose that's something that the regulator will have to be very mindful of. And um, based on experience in England from SSC a number of years ago for retail electricity, customer engagement in smart meters was very limited. Um, and, 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 you know, some previous surveys and studies showed that consumer, you know, once they're happy with something, they'll stick with it and are reluctant to swap around, I suppose that would fall into the same experience in the telecommunications sector. So I think we need to end now. Um, so we're going to move on to the next speakers. Are we going to have a, a five minute break, Brian, are we? Yeah, well, we, we'll have a two minute break, just a, a very short break and we, we'll kick off uh, for session two in two minutes. Thanks very okay. much. Cheers. Bye, guys. <laughs>